Are we on now? Very, very good. Let's, uh, let's start with a word of prayer. Ask Mark, uh, if he would, to, uh, to lead us. Let's pray together. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I should have said this uh, last week. I didn't do that, but uh, just really appreciate uh, the great turnout. We didn't really know when we we set out to think about a, a weeknight class uh, what the turnout would look like, and uh, it's just been really terrific. So I appreciate you uh, carving out the time, especially uh, the dads who brought your sons. Uh, I think that, uh, that that's really especially important for what uh, we're talking about. Uh, we do want tonight to be interactive, but I'll warn you in advance, it's going to be interactive in a different way. Uh, Jeff and I have some segments we want to cover tonight, and so we may kind of go on for a while, and you may think we've dropped into lecture mode. Um, not so. Uh, we're going to pause at some regular intervals and invite you to, uh, to share some feedback or ask some questions but there are some segments that we need to get through unbroken. So if we're going through a piece of that, uh, don't get discouraged with us and give up. We're still interested in doing this together. Uh, we want to begin by asking you to think about how you would answer this question. The question is, when did you first begin to use the Internet? In your brain, would you form up your answer to that question? When did you first begin to use the internet? Okay, got an answer in your brain? <laughs> now, now, this won't be an exact science, I know, but, but I'm going to make an assumption about this crowd. If you are under the age of 35, your answer to that question was an age. I was 12 when I got to use the internet for the first time, or something like that. If you are over the age of 35, I'm going to guess that your answer was a date, like a year. Are you with me, Troy? That's what happened in your brain? You're over 35, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why the difference? I wanted you to think about that because it's a way of illustrating that this technology is really a pretty new thing. So much so that there are some of us sitting in the room that choose a date because there was a period of our life when there was no internet, right? It wasn't about when do I get to do this, it's at what age did it become available to me? And so I wanted you to think about that. Because when we start getting into a conversation about moral combat and internet pornography, I think it is very important to understand that we are talking about something that is very new. Now, the problem of sexual immorality is not new. How long has that been around? Uh, forever, right? Uh, in in the Proverbs, Solomon has a whole section, five, six, and seven, that is largely a connection, collection of admonitions about sexual purity and warning about sexual sin. What I want to talk to you about tonight, though, is something that is novel, it is recent, something that hasn't been along, around very long, and for that reason, really, really a different part of this battle we're waging for our purity. So let me see if I can illustrate that a little bit by talking to you about the history of the internet, right? So first of all, I did not have a computer when I was growing up. Are there other men in the room that are in the same position? I was born late 1964, graduated in 1983, and in that period of history, there were, well, there were computers. They were filling whole rooms at NASA. They weren't sitting on anybody's desktop at home. Personal computers came a thing 
in the 80s, right? I got my first computer in 1986, a Mac 128 nine inch black and white screen. And I looked at that baby and thought, how will I ever need anything else but this, right? <laughs> Remember that? So, wasn't until I was into my adult married life that I even got a computer. No internet access in 1986, right? That's decade number two. It was in the 90s that the internet became a thing. I got my first internet service in 1997 when I moved to Florida. And yes, it was dial up. Can any of you hum the AOL log on tone? The handshake the, signal. Huh? The handshake signal. Yes, yeah. that's exactly right. I, that's, that's, that's where I had my first access to all of that was in, uh, you know, the late 90s. And first. then you got mail. Yes, that's exactly right. And that was the coolest thing is, <laughs> is, is getting email for yeah. the very first time. And here's the thing that I want to say about all that. Pornographers discover that these two developments was earth shattering for their enterprise. And now they could have a whole new market for their product. However, even that changed dramatically in the next decade with the advent of what? Who knows? Sorry? Before that. No, Before no, no, that. no. Before even that, there was the advent of high speed cable modem or whatever internet service because that allowed you to do what? Now you can stream content. You can watch videos online. I know what will be astonishing to the young men on the row back here. There was a time when you could not stream a video on the internet, right? There was a time where it took a while to download a piece of email, but with broadband coming along, I don't know. I think I got my first broadband service uh, around 2004. Does that sound a little early? That's about right. About right. When I moved to Beaumont, we got our first cable modem and first broadband services. And I've got to tell you folks with that, the porn industry just exploded. Now you have 40 million Americans who are regular users through this new venue. Uh, upside of that porn for pornography was a whole new audience. Downside was Wow, other things just went away. How many of you can remember porn, th not that you went, I understand, but can remember porn theaters? If a man wanted to see a pornographic movie, that was a drive to a seedy part of town with a theater that had parking in the back. Remember that? I was a very young boy when that was going on, but I do remember that. You remember... Adult, isn't it odd they call them adult bookstores for something so childish? Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, and, 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 you know, even, even uh, when, when cable TV came along, you could get pornographic material through cable. Yeah. You guys do understand that all of that has gone away, essentially. I mean, I'm saying it doesn't exist at all, yeah. but it doesn't exist much. What has happened is that the Internet, over the last two decades has pretty much taken over this market. And for the vast majority of men, the path to pornography is to a phone or a tablet, accessing the internet, and getting on online pornography. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about why that is, because that is a pretty significant change. I mean, you're talking about major, major developments in an enterprise happening in a relatively short period of time. Why is that? Let me give you four quick reasons. Number one, because it is so easily accessible, pornography through the internet, so easily accessible. When I was a kid growing up, when I was the age of these guys on the back row, I didn't have any access to pornography. 
I mean, like I said, that was a theater right. in a city part of town. Um, and there was just no option for me to go there. In fact, I can candidly tell you, I can only remember seeing pornography two times in my growing up here. There was a field behind our house where we used to go and build forts, and some of the older boys had gone back there and left a Playboy centerfold that they'd ripped out of a magazine, and some of us younger boys stumbled across it one time. And then the other time was at a friend's house who had some magazines that I didn't know anything about. But I didn't have any access to that kind of thing. By contrast, do men have access today? Where are we going? <clears throat> what Randy brought up, the smartphone. Got your phone. How quickly? How quickly can you get to pornography? Sitting right here in the church building. Three clicks? It's nothing anymore. Secondly, add to that that it's not only easy, accessible, but it's anonymous. Meaning? Do it, nobody knows. Nobody's going to see your car in the parking lot. Yes, and that was a barrier, wasn't it? Even with the parking in the back, somebody might see you come out. That's right. Or, or when I was a teenager, they began selling Playboy magazine at 7-Eleven. Do any of y'all remember this? This was a national scandal in America when 7-Eleven decided they were going to sell Playboy magazines. And I remember that because I would go up the counter to buy a candy bar and the magazines were behind the counter and they had these little cardboard covers over the front. And as a young guy just coming into puberty, all I could see was blonde hair and a female forehead peeking above the brown cover. And I was left to wonder, what is the rest hiding, right? I mean, you'd have to go into a store, buy something like that. Could not do that. But listen, with your own device now and the option, they've made it so easy for us with the operating system. We could surf privately and the ease at deleting history. Everybody knows how to do that now. I can do this and nobody's going to find out. I used to tell, I used to tell the teenage boys years ago that, you know, everybody gets caught. And I just can't say that anymore. You know why? Because they don't. It's pretty easy to do this and nobody, except the Lord, know about it. Third, there is an endless array of content available to us. How many porn sites are there? Millions. Millions and millions. So that a guy can take his laptop, open a series of tabs, and suddenly it's become the greatest porn theater ever in existence. There's not a movie to watch. There is a whole list of different movies to watch with any kind of perverse fantasy he wants to indulge. Someone says, David, too much. Yes, but the variety is an important piece of the problem. So I'm not being gratuitous when I say that. We need to know that. The fact that there's such a vast array of different stuff is a problem. And then finally, it's free. I, no, I know that there's pornography that has to be paid for, but there's also a vast array of stuff that doesn't cost anything at all. So no one's got to use the credit card. There's no charge. It's just there for the taking. And so when we talk about this becoming the path of choice, it really isn't difficult to figure out why. The consequence is that the problem has become pervasive. Lots and lots of men caught in the trap. In fact, safe to say, I'm gonna, my, my goal tonight is to see how many times I can say something about a statistic and Jeff not frown at me. Because Jeff and I have been arguing about statistics all week. Like okay. an old married couple. So, yes, that's right. So, so a majority of men. A vast majority. Uh, are in trouble with this. Now, illustrate that a couple of ways. There was a bar. By the way, are most of you familiar with who the Barna group is? Barna is a survey group 
religiously based. Religiously really based. Religious. Groups. And and as far as as far as people who do research and studies, reasonably reliable. Yeah, a, a brand name in this area. Uh, Two out of three men who identify as Christians, uh, monthly users. I realize that Christians are pretty broad, broad term culturally. See, I threw that in. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that's actually pretty much in agreement with the national average. Two out of three men say, over the course of a month, at some point, I'm involved in using pornography. Um, there was a 2019 study done of young men attending Christian colleges. Jeff would want me to say that the idea of a young man at a Christian college encompasses a pretty broad group of young men who have potentially different ideas about sex. All, all, all disclaimers on there, right? <laughs> so they surveyed this group of young men who were attending Christian colleges. 89% described themselves as occasional users of pornography. I'm always wondering about the 11% and how many of them lied on the survey. I always kind of believed that my mom was actually prodding someone to give me the survey and I worried that I would be confessing information she would get. But that's 89% that admitted it. Roughly two out of three <clears throat> described themselves as weekly users one out of four daily users, half of them said, we are addicted. So, because of what we said earlier, it's accessible, it's anonymous, it's free. We have this pervasive problem from which religious people are not untouched. The thing that we want to emphasize particularly tonight is that there are impacts that go with the choice, spiritual impacts, life impacts. And so winning this moral combat, one, is a grave challenge. This is a big deal. It's a great struggle for men today. See if you agree with this statement. The greatest moral struggle that men in 2021 are facing. Yeah, I think this is the more symptomatic sin we rip on, especially in Pride Month, LBGTQ and other things. Most of us will never struggle with this. But this, this is the true secret struggle that uh, and sexual sin for us today. And many of us will never actually commit sexual immorality or adultery in our wives. But, but this is the pervasive sexual sin that really is, I think, in the church and we have to wrestle with. It is the most important front in this moral combat we wage right. for our purity. Right. Or maybe to put it another way, more guys in this room are going to struggle with this than probably any other sexual sin. That's right. And, and to let me say it again, consequences far, far greater than I think people recognize and that we've talked about. So we're going to try to do that tonight. Uh, last thing I want to say about all that, and then we'll, we'll, we'll take some comments, is, is because of what's on the slide there, the fact that this is a pervasive problem, please do not feel like you are alone. And please do not feel like this needs to be the dirty secret that you keep to yourself. Lots and lots of Christian men are wrestling with it. And if that's you and a crowd of men this size, somebody's sitting in that place tonight. Truth is, many are. You don't need to go through this alone. This group of men is here to help and support and encourage. I want you to pay attention to how many of our shepherds have made it a point to be in this room. Some who would be here, but are out of town tonight, can't be here. They're here because they want to lend their support to you. So, so vital that we win this combat. So please ask for help. Don't struggle alone. So that's where we're starting. Let me pause and say, would somebody like to add a thought to that or ask a question about something we said? Wow. Yes, Charles. Yes. 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 So, so that's, that gets into that side of this that I don't think we talk enough about. That there are 
ways that this affects us over the long haul that are dramatic. And yeah, we're going we're to tap into that. Now. Yes. Um, I don't know specifically about those two issues, but linking what you said with what Charles said, I think that's exactly right. I think the trickle-down impacts of this in other ways, I don't think people have always recognized the connections of what's going on. There, there, there is a broader problem culturally with young men. Are you guys sensitive to that? Uh, Philip Zimbardo has done an outstanding job in his book, The Demise of Guys, sort of going through what's happening to guys today. Jeff, Jeff would want to talk about uh, the way that uh, men have been demasculated right. in our culture. Uh, a lot of guys have become consumed with gaming and that becomes their life. Pornography is a piece of that. Uh, it's a way of socializing without being rejected and all the girls are beautiful. So, so there is a broader cultural issue here of which this fits in someplace somehow, I think. I think that's right. Well, sure. Well, and, and, and a couple of things, and if I'm getting ahead, then you just stop me. But next week, David Pickup will be up here as well, and he's going to tap into this because next week in particular – pornography really is a symptom of, or pornographic addiction is a symptom of, and so to your point, a lot of those other sins, I mean, what it really is, is there, there's something even more deeply wrong than just, I have a lust problem, that may be part of it. There's something, you know, deeper that we can, we can tap into and begin to unravel, and, and that's why I think to your point, yeah, I mean, a lot of, a lot of other self-destructive behaviors for somebody who, especially who's severely pornographically addicted, a lot of those other compulsive behaviors may well, you know, tap in because of, of what's really sitting underneath this. Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, I was just going to say it is pervasive. And, and to me, there's like three categories. And you've talked about one of the three, which is you go looking for it. Uh, a second category is you look at something somewhat provocative. It clicks to something else that's more provocative. And then before you know it, you're, you're somewhere, whoa, you know, what's that? Um, a third way is it comes with Yes, it, it, it would be naive to believe that any man living in 2021 is not, without seeking it, going to stumble in to this kind of stuff, which is why it's all the more important that we build our defenses and be ready to do combat on this. We're, we're not going to be able to avoid it. So, for example, if you've got a teenage boy and you think, I don't have a problem with this, I have filtering software on my computer. No, there's going to be a problem. Every guy is going to have to wage a battle on this front. Every guy in 2021. And to what Rick said, because, you know, as somebody who's actually parenting kids through this era and, and what technology has done, two things immediately come to mind, you know, because I, because of what I do, it, you really hit something important. And all other dads in here hear this. In my experience, talking to young men, you know, in, in, in the church, you know, and, and you, about this issue when they're struggling with it, one of my first questions is always, how did it start? And almost always in the church, almost always it was an accident. It was a search that went bad and they didn't have filtering software on the computer or, you know, or just a link wasn't in the filter or whatever. It was almost always an accident. And yeah. once you saw it, the curiosity, you know. It's a pubescent boy whose curiosity can, is peaked and he can't unsee what he accidentally right. saw. And so that's something as dads, you know, in one sense, one thing to wrestle with. It awakens something. It awakens something that he never was out maliciously. And so part of the, the thing is that in one sense, as those of us who are parenting, because of the ubiquity of the pornographic culture, part of what we have to be pairing our kids for is not if they see it, but when they see right. it because of the environment that we are in. We're going to have to, to, to be preparing character to resist the temptation and just realize that in our hyper-pornified culture. Wow, is that really a phrase? It is now. Are all those um, are words? 
yeah. hyper pornified culture. Because here's the other thing too that as a parent right now really sits on my mind. You can keep the computers and smartphones out of your kid's bedroom, have maximum accountability and, and lock it down. But because of the smartphone, I can have absolute control over all technology in my house and that my children have access to. And they can be with a friend in the hallway at the church building who says back in a classroom back here, hey, look at this. And you know what? I can't do a thing about that except teach my children that when you see this, not if look away Here's because in this culture and given it, it is in our young people are struggling with this more than we realize those of us who were over 45 or 50. I cannot actually control or protect my children from this fully. I have to prepare them to do moral combat with not if, but when right. they see it. Let me, um, let me jump quickly to the biblical foundation we're working from. Now, Jeff and I decided that we would not dwell long on this. It's Thursday and you're sitting in a church building. We presume you came in here believing that men are to live sexually pure lives and that pornography is sinful, okay? I, if that's not where you are and we need to talk more than we will, we are happy to do that. But assuming that, we're going to be a little more quick about laying this biblical foundation uh, lest we plow ground about which we're all together. So, so why would we say that pornography is wrong? Four quick reasons I'll put on the slide with some text. Number one, obviously you have the lust issue. In fact, I don't really know that we need anything up, up there. The Lord said in Matthew 5, 28, if a man looks at a woman to lust for her, he is what? Already committed adultery in his heart. I think the strength of the language there is dramatic. In fact, what we miss is in 29 and 30, that's where the Lord goes on to say, hey, if you want to go to hell, you need to start plucking out your eyes and cutting off your hands. Uh, what does he mean? This is serious, and I need you to take it seriously. We get those some Galatians 5.19 in there, the yeah. word impurity that's used in that context as he deals with the works of the flesh and the sexual sins he has in mind. Purity is a really broad, broad term that I think would wrap in anything related to pornography. And, and just a quick 15-second amen to that. When you, you, I didn't think about this when we talked about this until you said it just now, the whole cutting your hands off, plucking out your eyes. Guys, especially the younger generation, drastic action may be needed. Yeah. I remember a few years ago talking to a young man, Christian, seriously addicted to porn. And I told him flat out, you need to get rid of your smartphone and get a flip phone. Yep. Full stop in the story. You want to save your soul? The smartphone's got to go. Get a flip phone so you can stay in touch. People can still call you, which is originally what the phone was for anyways. But you would have thought they said, cut off your hand and pluck out your eye. Now, now, to me, lust is the easy one. Probably the first one that comes to all of our minds. Most obvious one when we're talking about this problem. Though I don't think it's the only one. So I think there's a marriage piece to this. If we were to go back to Proverbs 5, where we have those warnings about sexual purity, warnings about sexual sin. You know, Solomon's solution for that is to delight in the wife of your youth. Do you remember that passage? Be satisfied with her breast. Teenagers are utterly freaked out that that's in the Bible. But it is. <laughs> what's, what's the point? The wise man is saying, the way you keep yourself sexually pure in part is to cultivate a healthy sexual relationship with your wife. The desires God had put in us, which are God-given and appropriate, have an outlet, have an expression. It's in the marriage relationship. It is not meant, and notice the carefulness of my language here, it's not meant to be a solo thing. It's meant for a man to share with his wife. That's the biblical plan. I'm just inspiring you tonight. You are. I'm just, I, I don't know why this didn't happen in the room. First Corinthians chapter 7. Paul actually is talking about if you can stay celibate, stay celibate, serve the Lord. But if you can't control your lust, it's not get an internet connection. It's better to marry than to burn. Yep. And that's, that's where this is supposed to be fulfilled. Uh, third piece we could add to this. I didn't know of a better way to say this, <laughs> so I called it the participation <laughs> piece. Um, when, when, when a man gets on the internet and engages in pornography, looking at pornography. 
we need to appreciate that we are participating in an enterprise. A $100 billion a year enterprise. This is a business. And when we join, we participate in the enterprise. In fact, we are key to the enterprise. We are what gives it life. The question is, what is the enterprise? If I could be candid, the enterprise is to shoot video of unmarried people fornicating to display for other people for their sexual satisfaction. Period. End of sentence. That's all that it is. That's the enterprise. Worse than that, when you get into it, it is an enterprise that destroys the participants. So if you doubt that, pay attention to the regular stream of news stories about the porn stars who took their life or the porn stars found dead from a drug overdose. Look at some of the documentary work that former porn stars have done who talk about what that life does to the participants. It is an awful, destructive enterprise. Now, to help bring that home to the men in this audience, it's not some woman who you don't know. It's your daughter. It's your granddaughter. How do you feel about the enterprise? It's not the same thing, is it? So will you remember when you're tempted with that, that every girl is somebody's little girl, somebody's granddaughter. And I'm helping keep afloat this awful enterprise that destroys her. So I think about Ephesians 5, 11 and 12. Don't participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness. We should abhor this business. Not keep it afloat. And then lastly, and I love this one because it's so easy, the discipleship principle. Jeff and I were talking about this today. Jesus, we're living in 2021. He were amongst us tonight talking about this. I don't think the Lord would say, hey, had a rough day? Go look at some porn. I mean, the whole notion of Jesus in any way, supporting, being involved in, practicing, any with, we immediately are repulsed at even the suggestion. We know what the Lord would be saying about pornography if he was on the scene today, right? And our goal is to be like our Lord. There's no place for this in the life of the disciple. So, lust, marriage, participation, discipleship, take your peak. I th pick, I rather, I think they work together to make a compelling case that we don't need this in our lives. There's no place for this in the life of the disciple. Another pause moment to see if y'all would like to add on to that or ask a question. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to re re resist saying any more about that because I'm going to say some stuff about that. So can I hold that? I'm coming to that and say more in just a minute. Anybody else like to wait? Yes, David, please. One of the really curious things, counterintuitive, I think, for all of us,
has been the growing problem among women, and I'm really glad you said that. I wish I had written down some statistical data. I've been reading about it for the last couple of weeks, but there has been a significant rise. I want to say that the number is about half of women have now are having an involvement at some level with pornography. Yes, not just a problem for the guys anymore. Yes. There is a reason that that is happening. So I'm going to use Logan's comment to segue into this last section that we're going to call the reason for the rules. So, so we just sort of laid out the biblical foundation from which we're working, what God has said about this. Here's a concern that I have. I think sometimes, especially for younger disciples, there is this view of the Bible that says the Bible is just a rule book. It's just a bunch of restrictions that sort of keep me from really being able to enjoy life. And I think one of the reasons people see the Bible that way is because we haven't spent enough time talking about the reasons for the rules. Why did God set it up this way? I, I, I would suggest that I don't think the commandments of God are ever arbitrary. I think they're rooted in his loving kindness, that everything God says do, it's because it's good for us to do. His love drives him to urge us towards what's good. And then the other side of that is true as well, that when God says don't do, stay away from that, it's because whatever that is, to pursue it is destructive. It is not for our good. There's a reason for the rules. And so we've seen that God said, don't look and lust and let sex be fulfilled in your marriage relationship. But why is it set up that way? And let me just tell you, there's a lot of controversy about whether or not pornography is a bad thing. In the broader culture, there's actually a great debate going on. There's one school of thought, David could probably speak to this better than I can, that basically says porn has been around forever. By the way, is that true? I don't know about forever, but it at least goes back to the time of the Greeks and Romans. I know that's true because Jeff told me today I was right about that, that, that there's Greek and Roman pornographic imagery. In fact, you were talking about Pompeii today and some of the images that have been preserved when that city was, was consumed with a, with a volcano. Maybe there's something to that. Um, <laughs> but but, 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 but pornography has been around, around for a long time. Sure. And the attitude of some is, it's just guys being guys. In fact, some would go as far to say, and I'm sad to say that some disciples have bought into this, if your marriage is kind of cooling romantically, Hey, get a little porn involved in that, and you could kind of spice up your sex life in your marriage. It's sort of this neutral, advantageous path that will help improve sex in your marriage. And so, and so there has been this controversy about whether or not porn is really a bad thing. So let me say a couple of things about that. First thing I would say about that is remember what we said at the beginning. Pornography as it is in our culture today, is unprecedented. It has never been accessible to men in the way it is accessible today. Number two, it is a relatively new development, which means there has not been a lot of opportunity for us to measure how men are affected by this. Now, I think the easiest way to do this is to illustrate what I'm talking about. So I want you to think about a 13-year-old kid back in 1998. Now, I just clipped these pictures off the internet, okay? But what I want you to know is the guys I'm describing are real guys. I could call names and tell you stories. So, this kid in 1998, who for the first time is getting internet access 
ever is a real kid that I know. And so in 1998, his parents get dial-up service, and he discovers when they're not home, he can, he can look at pictures. And so for the first time, he is able to see pornography at home on the computer. Okay? Now remember our timeline for a minute ago. Flash forward. Now the year's 2008, and he's not 13. He's 23. He's fresh out of college. He's got his own apartment now, except things have changed since 1998. Remember, now he has access to high-speed internet. What's going to happen to his habit? Oh, it's a whole new thing now. So you can open up a browser, open up a dozen tabs, have a dozen different porn sites, different, different kinds of video, because all that variety is out there, all that different stuff is there. And so this habit grows and multiplies. He's getting into more and more and more stuff, able to do more and more. As I said earlier, his little laptop becomes the greatest porn theater ever because it's limitless and it's free. So flash forward to 2018 and he's 33 years old and he's married and has children which mean now he doesn't have any more problem with porn right David because once a guy gets married this problem goes away right that's what I'm saying uh -huh. raw he's now nursed a 20 year habit that began in his formative years I want you to understand that it's only right now that we can begin to figure out how he's been affected by that habit because brothers, prior to 1990, this wasn't available. So do y'all see what I'm trying to say? It really wasn't possible for anyone in 2004 to talk about the long-term effects of this kind of pornography on men who experienced it during their puberty years and grew up this way. We didn't know any of that. In fact, what's probably the earliest we could begin to see that? But want to guess a date? 2010, maybe, before we begin to see the effects. And oddly enough, that's when the studies start. So I want to talk about this guy who is 33 years old and who's got a 20-year habit that he's been nursing since he was a prepubescent kid. How did it affect him? Well, what current studies are telling us is that these kinds of guys have terrible sexual dysfunction. It's a problem literally all over the world. And by sexual dysfunction, what I mean is that younger men have completely lost interest in sex. Some of you are thinking, that cannot be true. So, 2010, study in Japan found that young men were growing indifferent to sex, married men were having less sex. The number of men between the ages of 16 and 19. Can you guys with gray hair remember when you were 16 to 19 years old? I remember being 17. Uninterested in sex would not have described me at 17. How about you? These are guys in the prime of their sexual drive. The study found that the number of men between 60 to 19 who said they had no interest in sex jumped from 18% to 36% in two years. Do you hear that number? One out of three teenage boys in their prime of sexual life is, are saying we don't have any interest at all. And on the flip side with that, David, to jump in real quick. So sometimes you hear positive stats like teenage pregnancy rates are down. But you realize what the corollary of that is. It's not that kids are you know, becoming more moral or such, or, or that they're being more responsible if they're going to fornicate. It's literally our young people are pairing off and just living in their basements watching porn. Well, the, the sexual interest is going away in the young. A 2016 study, Canadian study, found, are y'all ready for this? 2016 Canadian study found that half of male teens struggled with erectile dysfunction. 
In fact, in Canada in 2016, the teenage boys had a bigger problem with ED than the old men. I want you to think about that. Time Magazine in 2016 carried a similar article. It found that before the internet, 5% of men who were under the age of 40 struggled with ED. Today, 33% struggle with it. Growing number of men, young men say they have no interest in sex. What is that about? What's happening to this group? A lot of these guys say that the porn they're looking at no longer satisfies them. I want you to think about that for a minute. The more traditional material satisfied less and less, which drives them to do what? Want to take a guess? To get into more non-traditional deviant forms of pornography. More and more the young guys report an inability to perform with real women. So one of the things I did for my research is I started reading forums. There are a number of public forums where guys who are battling this share their struggle. They write about it. And one of the guys in one of his posts talked about going away for his honeymoon. And on his honeymoon, he was unable to perform sexually with his wife. Think about that. Younger men are using, how do we say this gently? Performance enhancing medications. Guys in their 20s and 30s using Cialis. So that's the statistical data about what's happening with young men who have grown up with porn as their teacher about sex. There are other problems related with this. Uh, Gary Wilson, if you wanna do some more deeper research and reading, Gary Wilson has an outstanding book, Your Brain on Porn. And he says that studies show a correlation between porn viewing and depression, anxiety, stress, altered sexual taste, poor quality of life, lack of confidence, brain fog, loss of motivation. And in his book, he cites this guy's story, which I thought was really, really interesting. This guy, this guy said, as a child, I was highly athletic, smart, and sociable. I was happy. I had a million friends. He said that all changed around age 11 when I downloaded porn and progressed to every type of porn imaginable. The next 50... 15 years of my life were completely miserable. I was incredibly antisocial. I didn't talk to anybody. I sat alone at lunch. I hated everybody. I quit all the sports I played. My grades plummeted. As much as I hate to think about it now, I even started thinking about planning my own exit. In other words, taking my own life. By contrast, the guys on the forums who recover describe it as a renaissance. He said, it's like the sun came up in my life. They start businesses. They begin new ambitions. They start new workout programs. Life just completely changes when they give it all up. Now I'm going to come back to what you were talking about that because there is a, there is a science piece to this discussion. And so I'm going to tell you in advance that I don't know anything about the science part of this, but I can repeat back to you, and if you're curious and digging further, you can as well. I've read some about this. There, there are some things happening with the brain that account for all of this. So let me give you my layman's summary. The kind of pornography men can access through the internet taps in totally different ways into the pleasure systems and processes in the brain. Specifically, it unleashes huge amounts of dopamine, floods the brain with dopamine. By the way, that is why it is such a pleasurable experience. There are chemical things happening in the brain that make it that way. Does that make sense? 
here's the problem. When your brain gets used to that kind of dopamine flood that pornography creates, what happens when you're doing other stuff that just doesn't set off the brain that way? Like catching a touchdown pass. It just doesn't do it for you anymore. Or having relations with your own wife. Thank you. That was my next point. Was but it? you could go right ahead and steal it from me. That's I'm fine. Doing yeah. my part. Someone says, how could a guy on his honeymoon not desire sex with his wife? And the answer to that question is because porn does something in the chemical processes of his brain that being with his wife can't. Now... Do you see another problem shaping up? What's going to happen as guys continue to look at porn and continue to give their brain this, this flood of chemicals over and over and over again? What's going to happen? Brain's going to get accustomed to that too. And so it's kind of like a friend of mine who was a drug user. I asked him, used to be a drug user, recovery drug user. I asked him, I said, um, I said, you know this stuff is destroying you. Why do you use drugs? And he said, that's an easy question to answer. He said, there's no high like the first high. He said, after the first one, you spend your life trying to find something that will give you a high like the first time. And so that's kind of what we're talking about. Once the brain gets used to that flood of chemicals, you need something new. You need something different. And so that's, we said earlier that the variety piece of this is really important. It is. Because the internet will supply that. And so that's why guys who began with relatively normal sexual desires and feelings, you know, two years down the road, they're looking at homosexual pornography. What happened? How did they get there? Looking for the new and the novel. And then there's the guy that gets into the child pornography. Have you ever wondered how, do a man, how does a man get to the place where he does something like that? There's no high like the first time. And it's all about trying to recapture that again. Yes? I just have one thing to add. Um, when you say there's no high like the first time, what's so scary for young people that I don't think they realize is just one foot, one toe in the water can get you there. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they compare pornography to heroin, you know, and everybody is very... So, so what I try to say to the uninitiated about this is that it's never easier to say no than it is the first time. That doesn't mean you can't say no the second time. But it's harder to say no the second time. And after a year, it's more difficult. In five years, it's more difficult. Again, Reading the forums were fascinating. Guys, it is stunning. There are tens of thousands of men all over the world sharing their struggles in these very public forums to try to overcome this and to hear exactly what you're talking about. The failure and failure and failure and the frustration. I'm trying to get out of this and I can't do it. The interesting thing about it is... A lot of these guys are not doing it for religious reasons. In fact, some of them are overt about that. They say, listen, I'm not trying to get away from this thing because I have some moral conviction against it. I don't think, I don't think pornography is sinful. I just don't like what it's doing to they me. Want, they want their life back. I would rather be able to be with a real woman than staring at a screen. And that's really what the choice comes down to. Now, I do want to say this because that really sounded, I mean, that's almost as dark as you get sometimes. Um, <laughs> I, I do want to say that, <laughs> that the damage can be undone. The human brain is an amazing thing. And so, so one of the things they talk about in the forums is taking a 90-day fast. And these guys who will, who will stay off for three months 
they reset their brains and their desires essentially return to normal. Here's the curious thing about that. Who do you think has an easier time resetting, old guys or young guys? Nobody wants to touch that. That's what I would have thought too. <laughs> but it's not true. The older guys have an easier time resetting. The struggle is greater for younger guys. And I wonder about that. I wonder if the difference is that those of us who are older, the vast majority of us, because we didn't have access to this, our early sexual learning was essentially normal. We didn't learn about sex through pornography. That wasn't our puberty. And we've got young men who are growing up for whom the vast majority of their knowledge about sex has come through the purveyors of pornography. What does that do to your brain? It's a conditioning. It's almost like brainwashing. It's a conditioning of natural responses to something completely unnatural. It's like training a dog to come when it's whistled to or something. So, so the point that Jeff and I wanted to make about all of that is there is a reason for the rules. God designed us with the sexual desires that we feel and then provided an outlet for the expression of those desires. When we follow God's plan, it all works beautifully as he intended. When we do not, there are all kinds of negative consequences that follow. So we're going to get into next session some of the underlying causes. We're also going to deal with some very practical steps on maintaining our sexual purity. We do have a few minutes here at the end to open this up. I'm sure some of you guys want to get in and, and add your thoughts to this or ask a question. Please, please jump in. Yeah, right back here. Oh yeah. So I, I can't say that I've done I, I've done extensive research. I have listened to probably a half dozen biographies um, of former people in the porn business, and I can tell you just from the little bit that I have heard. Now these are adults, not children. Um, what do you think that drives people to get involved in this? Desperation. Because what? Well, because they are they have no other option. Money. Yeah. It sure. is. I went out to Hollywood. I think this story's been replicated more times than I can remember. To be an actress, I could not get work. I was starving. And someone came along and said, hey, you're pretty. You can make $1,000 today. And it was, it was driven by desperately being in need for money. That, that, that is really an interesting angle to come at, for, at this from because, because yeah, yeah, that is absolutely oh, true. Yeah. It is, it is as dirty a business as there is. Yes.
That, 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 is, that is a really important distinction to make. You heard me mention a minute ago how many news stories there are about porn stars who have overdosed or committed suicide or things like that, right? Guys who are gray-headed. When did we hear anything about that 30 years ago? That wasn't in the news. Nobody talked about that. And it is because of the mainstreaming of pornography. That is exactly right. And, yes. you, and you can do it yourself because of technology at home. Which is which is the new, which is where it's all going. Correct. Is, is Correct. individuals producing their yeah. content. Yeah, anybody can do this at home now. Yeah, Dave. Uh, part of the, and I'll probably talk more about this next week, but part of the damage that's serious that we don't often think of is purely emotional. Uh, essentially, men stay boys. They don't grow up. And so if you're a boy, because you have no emotional maturity to have a marriage and children, and you can imagine the terrible effects on eventually the relationships. I don't think women want to be married to boys. So if you are pervasive with that issue and or, and or actually addicted to that, then essentially at some point you're gonna stay an immature boy and you're not gonna know the, the power and the beauty of what it's like to be in love or making master of that, uh, that a, a full-grown man is able to celebrate and to, to experience with his own wife and then have a mature uh, father-child relationship with your, it all just flows into those emotional stunted growth issues. So, so one of the things that we were trying to do tonight is, is to say that there's a whole lot more to this than just, hey, God said don't lust. And, uh, and, and so when you open that door, to how man's thinking is affected long-term. I have to tell you, that's just Pandora's box to me. That scares me to death. I have wondered, so, so we've used, we've, we've sort of benchmarked 35, and I told you the guy in my timeline is a real guy. That real guy I was describing to you before his secret life came out probably was in a 10-year window to be an elder in the Lord's church with this private habit going on. Let me ask you something. How do you think a man whose brain has been shaped towards sexuality by pornography, how does he process a couple having marital trouble? How does he process women? How does he process the issue of modesty? Start thinking about all of the different dispositions and attitudes that wind up being impacted in all kinds of negative ways because of the habit. So I'm sorry, I piggybacked on what you're saying to say, boy, you could just blow this thing up when you start thinking about yeah. all the different long-term ways it in fact impacts men and, and broad, more broadly, even the people of God. Well, and, and just a little bit more on that, because again, I'm thinking as a father, talking to other fathers in the room, you know, who we're all trying to raise our kids in this, you know, hyper-pornified age. You know, part of what David's tapping off to, and this is what we need to think about, what porn does is it takes you inside yourself. In other words, part of maturity is learning to deal with others by relating to others. It's dating girls. You don't need the fornication aspect, but literally you learn emotional health and emotional maturity by interaction with others. And porn short circuits all that because it lets you basically turn inside yourself and be satisfied with what's going on inside yourself. And so you literally can't come to maturity. Um, especially in your relationships with the opposite sex, because you have completely turned inside and you're not learning how to relate to other people. Maturity comes from relationships and, and interacting with other people, including the opposite sex. And porn just aborts it. Randy's been waiting there. Yeah, I'm an old guy. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah that's right. Coming. That, that sounds good. Well, and to go one step worse, Randy, I saw an article recently was talking about full body suit virtual reality. Yeah. And that's really the nightmare that you were tapping into, Stephen. That's what's coming is now, I mean, to really be crass, the sex doll phenomenon, and, and, and you're going to be able to plug into the web and not just look anymore, but... Candidly, it's different than what we would have talked about 10 years ago. Because 10 years ago, brothers, we didn't know any of the information about how men are being affected by this. That's all in the last decade that we've begun to get our minds around the impact. Uh, let me get Tim and Malcolm, and those will be our last two because we actually ran over a little bit tonight. I apologize. Y'all ran over a little bit tonight. How about I do that? Tim? I was just going to say I've had, I went back and looked at my files. And I've had 15 clients who were members of the conservative church. Every female that hired me, porn was a problem for her husband. About 40% of the men that hired me, porn was a problem for their wife. Yep. So just touching on what David said earlier. Yep. Yep. It's, it's crossing the, the, the zone. Yep. To the other side. Now, I was thinking about an article I read that was talking about the problem in our society with the idea of we're, we're shying away from absolutes, right? No one believes in absolutes anymore. There's no supreme good or supreme bad. There's this idea that there's levels and everything is better or worse. And so one of the problems with pornography may be that a guy goes, well, I can either go out and fornicate or I can do this. Yes. But they don't see it as as wrong because it's better. Or I can I can go out and commit adultery or I can watch pornography. I won't commit adultery because I know that's bad, but this is better, so this must be <coughs> Yeah. We we call that the stinking thinking. Because when we decide we want to do something, we'll figure out a way in our brain to justify whatever path we're determined to take. We guys are really, really good at that. And I hope that one of the things the conversation will do tonight is to say, you know, it's all bad. Yeah, you don't want to cheat on your wife. There are consequences of that. But you don't want to be staring at a screen looking at porn because there are consequences of that too. It that dramatically can impact uh, a guy's life and, uh, and his walk. So anyway, thanks so much again for coming tonight. Yes, sir. So, so one of the things we're going to do in, in the upcoming sessions, next Thursday, we're going to dig into some, some underlying factors, which I think is really, really important because it's easy to see the problem on the surface and want to try to do something to deal with the problem without underlying, understanding what's underneath generating the problem. And then finally, we'll wrap up in the last session, do some really, really practical stuff about solutions and how we help each other win this moral combat that we're engaged in. So those will be the next two sessions. This was kind of a downer, I know, but we really need to be convicted about the problem so that we're ready to work the problem. And that's what we're going to do 
uh, moving forward. Uh, let's wrap up with a prayer. John Cogdo, would you mind uh, leading us in a prayer? That would wrap us up tonight. Yeah.